Welcome back to Tipping Point. I'm your host, Kara McKinney. Imagine taunting an elderly woman to not die in prison. And the reason she's going to prison, despite her ill health, is that she made the courageous decision to dedicate her life to saving the lives of unborn babies. You may remember us talking about Paula Harlow the other week. I'm bringing her up again tonight because now there have been some updates that you'll just have to see to believe. But first, some context. The 75-year-old was just sentenced to two years in prison after being convicted on FACE Act violations. Back in 2020, Harlow and her fellow pro-life demonstrators prayed and sang hymns at a D.C. area clinic run by the infamous abortionist Cesare Santangelo, who has been accused of possibly killing some late-term babies after they survived his butchery. Even when Biden's DOJ really tried to play up the situation, the best they could do was to say that some of the demonstrators tied themselves to chairs, and so they kind of blocked some of the clinic's doors. Big whoop. And yet with a straight face, the DOJ tells us that these actions are equivalent to violence. That's violence, but not butchering babies. Got it. As we mentioned when the, the news first broke, the judge Colleen Kolar Cotelli smugly told Harlow and her tearful husband that she hopes Harlow will make an effort to remain alive because that is a tenet of her religion. So this judge knows she's sentencing a woman to death. At least it's a big possibility that she will die behind bars as a political prisoner of the Biden regime. But like Pilate, the judge is washing her hands of her share in that guilt and is trying to put all the pressure on a 75-year-old woman facing what no one should have to. If Harlow was Muslim or some other faith aside from Christian Catholic, do you think the judge would be able to get away with mocking her faith like that? This is a woman who lives what she pr preaches. Harlow not only attends pro-life events, but she also personally raised six kids, including four who were siblings in need of an adoptive family. That totally busts the myth that pro-lifers only care about babies before they're born and the other old argument that if pro-lifers cared so much about these babies, they would adopt them themselves. Now that I've caught you up to speed, it only gets worse from here because now investigative journalist Julie Kelly has obtained the full transcript from that hearing. Turns out the judge denied Harlow a sentence of home detention, saying, quote, the defendant's own medical needs do not and should not prevent this court from imposing a just and sufficient sentence for the defendant's decision to prevent others from accessing the health care that they needed, end quote. She also denied a request by Paula's husband to be allowed to go to prison with her, fearing that she would die without him. And that's what prompted the judge to make her disgusting remark that essentially, if Paula really loves her husband and is a true Christian, she wouldn't let herself die of despair in prison. The feds also told the judge that they opposed Paula Harlow being allowed to attend her own local church during the search for a prison to accommodate her poor health. And they had the audacity to present themselves to the court as being so magnanimous because they, the feds, only recommended between 33 and 41 months in prison for Harlow, who ended up getting 24, where some other pro-lifers convicted on the FACE Act were threatened with upwards of 11 years behind bars. It's like Big Brother kicking you in the teeth and making you thank him for the opportunity to go get dental work done. It's sickening. They take pleasure in this power over good people. And it calls to mind an interesting conundrum. And that is the role religion plays in our society today. Seems like most people could care less about God except where they can use him to some political benefit, like beating up on a poor lady. Left, right, center, we're all prone, though, to making God fit into our politics instead of drawing upon God's wisdom to inform our politics. Our next guest tonight wrote a very thought-provoking article for First Things Magazine in which he discusses the very real phenomenon of algorithmic spirituality. Joining us now to discuss is the author of this piece, Grayson Quay, a news editor for The Daily Caller. Grayson, thanks for being back tonight. Thank you for having me back on, Kara. Great. So what exactly is algorithmic spirituality? So my example that I use to kind of dip my oar in is Bible apps, which, you know, there's lots of Bible apps that will display a verse of the day. Sometimes you can get it as kind of a widget on the home page of your phone. And it's nice, but I did a little bit of a deep dive and I found this article from 2018 that explained how these Bible apps work. And basically they work on an algorithm that looks at what verses are being shared and liked the most often and highlighted the most often with people when people are reading their Bibles through this app. And it feeds those to people uh, as the verses of the day so that you're much more likely to get verses that are kind of very feel good or very therapeutic. And you're much less likely to get verses that are these kind of tough morsels of theology.